I believe I can fly. Think about it every night and day. Uh. I'll spread my wings and fly away. <laughs> I believe I can fly high. I believe I can touch the motherfucking sky. I think about it every night and day. Spread my no wings weights. and I fly away. Hey, hey, yeah. Wick up, wick up, wick up. All right. <laughs> Ready? I like making fart noises with my mouth. This is supposed to be a mature show. Mature audiences only. For your mother. All right. No, I mean, like, we're going to be mature. Just no, no more farts, that's no, all. No farts. <laughs> okay. Mr. Oh, you gotta make sure it's professional, and then I gotta fucking edit out. Fucking, fucking. <sighs> You're an outlaw, Rick. Let's go. Come on. Welcome back to another edition of the House that Alan built. This is episode 31. I'm Scott Kamartin. With me, as always, Greg Vollmer. Today, we're gonna do the recap of the NFL season. We're gonna start with the Buffalo Bills, and then we're gonna recap the rest of the league, some highlights, and some, uh, some recent low lights. updates, some lowlights, yeah. Fantasy. If we're gonna talk positive, let's talk about Josh Allen, who became the first quarterback in NFL history to have three seasons of 35 plus passing touchdowns and five plus rushing touchdowns. Yep. That 35 plus passing TD club, he joins Mahomes, who did it in 2020, 2021, 2022, so three years in a row. Yeah. Manning, 2012 through 2014. Breeze, 2011 through 2013. And Favre, who did it all the way back in 95, 96, mm -hmm. 97. That's good company. It is good company. Now, has Josh Allen regressed in 2022? Uh, very slightly. Slightly, maybe. Yeah. I, I think not when you're still looking at the numbers. I have a breakdown of his first season was 2018. He played 12 games. After that, he played 16, 16, 17, 16. Last year, he played 17. That was the first year where the NFL played 17 regular season games. This year, because we had that no contest game against Cincinnati, he played 16. So we're going to look at averages more so than yards. In 2020, that was his peak numbers. That were That's where he was a runner-up to Aaron Rodgers for MVP, 284 uh, per game for yards, and he averaged 7.9 yards per attempt. This year was actually his second best at 7.6 yards per attempt and his second best in yards per game at 267.7. Now, touchdowns. His best was 37 touchdowns in 2020 with his least amount of interceptions. Well, second least because... In 2019, he only had nine. He had 17 less touchdown passes in yeah. 2019. So 37 and 10. This year was 35 and 14. Last year's was 36 and 15. 35 touchdowns, 14 interceptions for a while there when he was throwing picks in the red zone left and right. We were like, well, damn, he's going to get 20. Yeah. Good thing he didn't finish worse in interceptions thanks to Dak Prescott and Davis Mills, but he did finish second worst. There was a three-way tie there. Interceptions... Um, not a big problem when you're throwing 30 to 40 touchdowns a game, but still a, sorry, a game I mean, a season. Still, it is. It still is the main reason why he is not in the MVP talk now. True. He's not going to be a part of the MVP One thing, consideration. His MVP consideration in 2020, he only had 10 interceptions, but he had six fumbles lost. This year, he only had three. So if there's a silver lining, I'd say that's it. Attempts, he actually threw the most this year, but his overall completion percentage, 69.2 in 2020. And then 63.3 this year and last year. Exact so same exact for the last same. Years. And yardage, like I said, it, it's within eight yards per game from last well, year. Well, and he's without Increased. the without that one additional game that got canceled, he would have probably matched or beat his total yards thrown. Yeah, and and so. even though it was in 16 games, he probably would have had 37 to 40 touchdowns. You know, you never know with that one other game because that was it, well, yeah, the Bengals, it, was, it could have been a shootout. It was going to be a shootout. It yeah. looked like it had all the fixings to be one. So my answer, did he regress? No. In some ways, he got better. In some ways, red zone, he got worse. Third down, they were number one in the league for third down conversion. So I'll take that. Obviously, that's huge. Some of that had to do with his scrambling ability. And his sacks were down, so he was able to scramble. And offensive line got a little better. Uh, there was some cohesion, but also there were some injuries again. So we had some shifting around. There's Mitch Morris had another concussion this year. There's at least 25 other clubs that wish that they had Josh Allen putting up these numbers. Yeah. And then, then we didn't even get into his career rushing. So in 2018, he had 631 yards and eight touchdowns with one fumble loss. 
2019, 510 yards, and then 2020, 421. So his best passing season was 2020, and his worst rushing season was 2020. So obviously he was more of a pocket passer. He learned how to take what the defense was giving. In 2021, he had 763, and this year in one less game, he had 762. Yep, he would have beat it. He would have beat it if the kneel downs weren't there too. Either way, he went from eight touchdowns to nine to eight to six to seven. Not bad. He's a red zone threat no matter what. Even if he's going to turn the ball over, a lot of times he's also converting into touchdowns. He finished sixth in passing yards per game throughout the league, 267.7. Mahomes was number one. Burrow was two. Herbert was three. Brady was four. And Tua was five. And the discrepancy here... Mahomes, 308.8 yards per game. And number five was Tua at 272.9. And Allen was six, so 267. We're talking the matter of 20 to 30 yards from first to fifth, sixth, and then it drops off bad. Allen tied for second in passing TDs with 35 with Burrow. And number one was Mahomes, who had 41. Yeah. He, he's a clear MVP favorite this year. Geno Smith? He was number four with 30. And you yep. said he set a franchise record in... Passing yardage and completion percentage. Okay. That's that's big. I mean, yeah. good season for him. But right now we're still talking about Allen. He was in a three-way tie for the second most interceptions, like I mentioned. It was Cousins and Carr. And then obviously ahead of them, I, I mentioned, was Prescott Jesus. and Mills. Yeah. Allen was eighth in QBR at 96.6, behind Tua, who had 105.5. He had a, a couple less games, but obviously having Waddle and Hill helped with your deep ball and your completion percentage. And still a good season for both of those guys. It sucks that Tua had to go out. It would have been nice to see a clash like the early Kelly Marino days, it, w- it could have been Alan Tua, which I don't want to put Tua on that same pedestal as Marino right now. Um, and he he may never play again. Yeah, I wish that uh, there weren't more important things to have to worry about than this pivotal playoff game where he could have had a chance to continue this rivalry. But unfortunately, there are more important things for him to worry about. And number one being his mental health, his overall physical health, his yeah. well-being for the rest of his life depends on who you ask as far as how many concussions he's had to this point some say two some say three if you would have had a third or a fourth concussion had had he tried to play again you're talking potentially irreversible brain damage there could already be his first concussion was matt milano hitting him in the backfield in Miami, that was uh, the game with all the heat. And yes, the game where he injured his back. And then the next game, he had the fencing, um, not against us, but that's when he was officially pulled. And then he had another one. And then this past time, you know, it was Mike McDaniels who um, was asking Tua about the game they were playing and the recall some plays. And Tua was confused and didn't remember it. And he and McDaniels is the one who reported it to the training mm. staff. So after all that, you know, all the publicity going on with him getting through the, you know, the staff with that first and second concussion, this time it was actually the head coach who shut him down. And then he already has said that he's not going to play in the playoffs, at least the, the first round if they were to get past the Bills somehow. So Skyler Thompson is who the Bills will face in the upcoming matchup. But we're still talking about the 2022 recap. Highest rated quarterback in the regular season by PFF was Josh Allen at 91.7. Followed by Mahomes at 91.3, uh, Burrow at 91, and Hertz at 85.9. So our offense this year, how did we finish? We finished not too bad. No, with a with a rookie offensive coordinator, mind you. Uh, yeah, second in points per game, 28.4. Uh, second in total yards per game at 407.7. That's a lot of yards per yeah. game. And then seventh in passing and rushing. So you're at, you're looking at 268 yards a game passing, 140 yards per game rushing. Yeah, I'll take it. Ken Dorsey hasn't been perfect this year, and there's been some bumps and bruises, which is should be expected. I think, um, I think maybe I, I had probably too high expectations for him, just knowing that this was his first time with the full command of being the coordinator. I, I'm I'm most proud of the fact that he did find balance in the second half of the season and really leaned on the running game, especially to kind of help get Allen out of his funk when he was starting to turn the ball over. But it's really given us that added dimension. And like I've already preluded to, going into now the most important part of the season in the next month, having that run game be something that defenses have to respect and knowing that we can not only have the deep ball going, but we can also control the clock and keep the opposing quarterback off the field. Yeah, I think for a first year, he obviously, you know, he he has kind of a a vanilla offense, if you will, because he's still kind of learning schemes and ways to figure out what the defense is doing as far as man-to-man and, and zone. And, you know, for Allen, he might have slightly regressed, but he was under Dable for several years, and now he had a new offensive coordinator. 
And Dorsey's actually being interviewed in Carolina for the head coaching spot. He comes through that tree, which is where McDermott and Bean got him from. And if he gets that opportunity, so be it. We have Joe Brady who could step in. I think he would be the prime candidate to replace him if needed. I don't want to see one and done unless he wins a Super Bowl. And I, mean, yeah, I, think, not... I think Dorsey also benefited by having Josh Allen, for sure. Because through that, the growing pains, he had somebody to cover up some of those mistakes. It's not ideal to have to go into a new uh, system again, a new coordinator. And it could be somewhat of a new system because that's the beauty of this one is that they were able to kind of maintain somewhat of the same system given that Dorsey was kind of the understudy to Dable. Yeah. But now say they actually have to say they go not in-house and, and get a different one. Theoretically, oh, they'll have I think, options. yeah, and Allen's smart enough. He's I think he's shown that he should be smart enough to be able to handle that. He, um, he would have a say too. Yeah. Yeah. Just like he and, did with Dorsey. He you know, and it would Brady. be a challenge, but he's got the head on his shoulders, I think, to yeah. be able to handle a challenge like that. Cerebr- cerebrally and physically. Yeah. And now we get into our receiving. There's no doubt that Diggs was the go-to guy for Allen this year. 1,429 yards on 108 receptions, 11 touchdowns, 89.3 yards per game. Yeah. He was the guy you could always rely on. There were a couple games where he had 26 yards and whatnot. But when you're still winning by 21 because you've got other guys that can get the ball and score, you know, you could take that. We've talked about it. It's well documented that Gabriel Davis had his struggles with drops, probably would have broke a 1,000 yards. He had 836 on 48 receptions and seven touchdowns. His 17.4 yards per reception is one of the best in the league, and he had close to 60 yards a game. We'll take it. Knox had a pretty consistent game uh, this year. or you know, Came on strong in the second he half. Did. He did. From blocking to being more uh, involved in the red zone. Yeah. His first 12 games, he had only two touchdowns, and the last four, he's had a touchdown in each of those games. He finishes with 517 yards and those six touchdowns at 10.8 yards per reception, 34.5 yards a game. You can't ask for much more for a tight end unless you're Travis Kelsey or you know someone similar to that. And McKenzie, 42 receptions, 423 yards, and four touchdowns. So he had 28 yards a game, 10 yards a catch. Number five was Singletary, number six was Cook, number seven was Shakir, and number eight was Quentin Morris. Cook had 21 receptions, Singletary had 38, and but Cook is really the one that came on later on in the year. He had 100 less yards than Singletary, but 10 less touches. Shakir, 21 receptions. I like to think that that'll double next year. Uh, we talked about Gabe Davis having like 40 receptions or 35 receptions each of his first two years. I'm thinking that he's on that pace for 35 to 40 for next year. We don't know what's going on with Beasley or John Brown for next year or Kumaro. We can only focus on these young guys and their development, and I think that he's on the right page. I think Quentin Morris for a, a second tight end was good. It was nice of him to see or see that he got his first career touchdown. Tommy Sweeney obviously went out with an injury early on and wasn't a factor. Other than that, I'd like to see them draft or maybe even get one in free agency now. There was talk, uh, an interview with Gronk, and there was rumors that he would come out of retirement, maybe in the playoffs, or maybe, because Brady's back in the playoffs, maybe he would feel like, would you play for your hometown team? He goes, I always wanted to do that. I grew up watching and going to the games. He and his brothers would go. It would be kind of cool to see him officially retire and be with the Bills. Um, Whether that's actually an option or not, who knows. But he'll never be a tight end one for us with Knox. I I, I don't think so. He would still be nice to have as an extra threat if it's a possibility. Mm. He's got... Maybe a couple of years left. No, no, I just, yeah, it's like we were talking about that last year. Didn't happen. Yeah. No, it didn't. And obviously with him retiring, he said he he's happy with retirement. He's doing a lot of commercials. But who knows where that'll go. As far as rushing, we know that Singletary had the most rushes with 177 this year. That was for, good for 819 yards and five touchdowns. Like you've been pounding the table all year, 4.6 yards per carry. He had one that broke out for 33. It was his second longest uh, run of, mm-hmm. the, of his career. He did have two fumbles lost. Two fumbles and two fumbles were lost. So uh, this last game, he had a a fumble. Luckily, it wasn't too costly, but we did lose our field position, obviously. Allen finished second with 124 rushes for 762 and seven touchdowns. And then Cook, 89 rushes, 507 yards, and two touchdowns. He's really come on strong as well as a rookie. You can see that these coaches have developed these guys, and he, like, hesitates like Le'Veon Bell used to, and then he would just hit the hole. Yeah, the develop is the key word you mentioned. Yeah. Our coaching staff has become very good at developing players. Yeah. And having patience and not 
doing what some teams do or they just hell or high water. They're just, they're, they're going to try to put a, a square peg into a round hole and something just that doesn't always work. No. So they, they let him come along slowly and let him take his bumps and bruises and the patience paid off in the second half of the season. And it was nice that halfway through the year, right before the trade deadline, the Bills traded um, Moss. He got another. He got an opportunity with the Colts, and that's all he was asking for. We got Naheem Hines out of it. You know what happened since then with the kickoff returns. Um, and then McKenzie had nine rushes for 55 yards and a touchdown. Nothing fancy. You know, he was doing a lot of those those uh, jet sweeps and whatnot. He didn't really do that much. Yeah. Uh, Dorsey doesn't make the same play calls as Dable, so maybe... And I don't want to say disappointing, but I think... Um... The biggest underachiever. People think a lot of fans might be thinking that Gabe Davis is the biggest underachiever. I would say McKenzie's probably the biggest underachiever based on what we maybe expected of him going into the beginning of the season. We know we know who he is though. Last year he had a couple good games. He filled in for Beasley against the Patriots and went off for over 100 yards. This year he did the same thing in one game. He's good for one or two of those this season. And other than that, you know, a, a couple surprises here and there. Really, we've had. We tried to bring Beasley back for um, a slot guy. You know, Shakir could move around. There's guys that that can that are young and probably going to do that job better down the road. It's kind of like last year with Gabe Davis in the playoffs against the Chiefs, and then McKenzie's performance against the Patriots. Yep. That that you mm-hmm. know when uh, yep. Big, uh, when Beasley was out. Mm-hmm. It's not. It's never going to be probably as good as that, but it's never going to be near as bad as I think we we think. Yeah. Or you know, yeah, it's, he, it's somewhere in the middle. There he's a nice player. I mean, after all, he is the face of the franchise. Do. Yeah, he's the, yeah, uh, a little dirty, a little dirty. And Diggs, who finished third for the most receiving touchdowns in the league with eleven, that was nice to see. And that was a tie with Kittle and AJ Brown. And number one uh, was. Adams with 14 touchdowns and Kelsey with 12. A tight end with the second most yeah. touchdowns in the league in the air. That's, I mean, Mahomes still has him. I honestly think Mahomes elevates the players around him. So with or without Kelsey, he's going to have some wins under his belt and, and have, obviously, guys that he's going to give touchdowns to. Look at McKinnon. You picked him up. Yeah. You picked him up. He's had nine touchdowns Six in the Six games last... in a row with a receiving touchdown, yeah, I think, it... or seven games in a row. All I know is he has a bunch in a row, and he's And had then they've got the that number 84 who, who's been, forgot his name, but <laughs> Same. number well, 84. We'll remember For the old some Chiefs. Time. Now, if we're talking about the Bills still, we get into the defense. We know that Greg Rousseau led the team with sacks at, with eight. Von Miller, who played in last games, also had eight. And then behind them was Epinesa, who had six and a half. They were second in points um, against per game, 17.9. So they have averaged 28.4 scoring and allowing 17.9, which is why they had the second best point differential in the league, just behind San Francisco. And then sixth in total yards against per game, 319 yards a game. And then 15th in passing, so they're right in the middle of the road for their 268 allowed per game. Nothing crazy good. Yeah, not having Hyde all year. You know, um, not having Trey White for over half the year. Yeah, so they've allowed as much as they actually did. So uh, passing was 267.7, and they allowed 268.2. That's half a yard. And then rushing, they got way better. You know, I know they still had their third down. It would be third and long, and then we have a long run for a, a third down conversion. It's like, come on. Yeah, our Even third though, down defense in general, yeah, run and pass. We were, we were doing well on offense on third down, but then our defense was giving up so many that it was like, it still it ended up balancing out as far as time of possession and movement of the ball. You like to see that they they were the fifth best at, at uh, rushing yards per game at 104 and a half. So not bad. Thirteenth in sacks. That's where I think we can get a lot better. And when Von Miller is hopefully yeah. healthy, it will get better. Von Miller would have moved us up a few ticks. Yeah, I mean, forty on the season is not that great, especially when you've got the team or the season lead was Philadelphia. They had four guys with over ten sacks. Yeah, and they had seventy two. That's, That's crazy. 32 more than us. And we were fourth in interceptions. We had three in the last game and 17 for the year. So I'll take it. It was a, a pretty solid performance, offense and defense. You know, in the past, the Bills would always have a good offense and a terrible defense or a fantastic defense and a shaky at best offense. And we finally have some balance, offense, defense, special teams. It's really nice to have guys that you can rely on. And like we mentioned, the development has been great. On the season, Edmonds led the team in tackles, 102. Uh, 65 of those were solo. He had one sack and an interception and seven passes defense. Milano, just under 100 tackles with 99. 72 of those were solo. So, obviously, I'd say he was the best tackler on the team. He did have some missed tackles, 
But in general, he's a guy that once he makes contact with the ball carrier, they go down more yeah. often than not. He's very good against mobile quarterbacks like Lamar Jackson. Hopefully, maybe hurts if we were to see him in, you know, Mahomes. Mahomes. Yeah, the guys that, that can scramble. But he had three interceptions, and he had the only one with a, um, a touchdown return from the, an interception. So that was really nice to see. Taron Johnson, best slot corner in the league, 89 tackles and an interception with nine passes defense. So we'll take it. And number four, with a few less games and other guys, Damar Hamlin. 88 tackles, 60 of them were solo. He had one and a half sacks. I love the way he was tackling. He was aggressive. We had criticized that he had missed tackles and missed opportunities, but six foot, six foot one, 200 pounds, and you're rushing from the outside. You know, they they were using using him on blitzes, and it was yeah. nice. And yes, he did get burned a couple times, but he's young, and Waddle's one of the fastest guys in the league. It's going to happen. You know, hats off to you, buddy. I hope you get healthy enough to possibly attend games and maybe play again in your lifetime if that's what you want to do. Then, of course, Poyer. Rock solid, played in 12 games. Bills won all those 12 games. Mm -hmm. uh, 63 tackles, four interceptions, eight passes defense. And then Jackson was next with 57 tackles and two interceptions, 12 passes defense. Elam, 13 games, 39 tackles and two interceptions. So these guys, you know, they, it, it was pretty spread out. Daquan Jones, 38 tackles and two sacks. Yep. Not a lot of sacks, but he's that run stuffer in the middle, and he gets some pressure, but it's really Rousseau who who thrived with 37 tackles and eight sacks, four passes defense. When you get those guys like Epinesa and Oliver up there and batting the ball, those are big because some of those are third downs and they're trying to go across the middle. And Von Miller, when he got injured, was that seven sacks, eight? Eight, yeah, eight he, he tied Rousseau. So he obviously would have been the, the leader. He was right up there. But Oliver, 34 tackles, two and a half sacks, and a safety. The only one who huh, tackled the quarterback in the end zone for a safety. And Shaq Lawson, who I'm so glad to have back. I want him to retire a bill. I love his energy. He had 30 tackles. Dotson had to fill in whenever Edmonds or Milano got hurt. He finishes with 28 tackles and a sack. And then Jaquan Jones, who is also a safety, who they've moved around, 25 tackles, interception. Um, I, I don't want to bore you with all that, but those are the main highlights for the defensive stats. Um, the defense, like I said, finished second in net points. Um, plus 169. That means they allowed 169 less than their offense scored. Mm -hmm. You're going to win a lot of games doing that, and it was just behind San Francisco by four points. Yeah, um, which and, is a popular Super Bowl pick. I know that's up. true. That is true. And the number seven seed who we're playing this week, Miami, they're over or they're uh, at negative two. So they've allowed two more points than they scored. Yep. And that's with. You know, Tua had a lot of yards, but even someone like Tyreek only had seven touchdowns. 1,700 yards, whatever it was, it was a lot. Yep. But just not a bunch of uh, touchdowns. So we get into our special teams here. Tyler Bass, 27-31. to 31. He had a couple misses. Luckily, it didn't cost us much. 56 long. We know he's good in the 50s. They never have him go for 60, you know. I guess we haven't really had that opportunity, have we? Not many. No. no. Now, there was a couple weird ones with the wind in Buffalo or Chicago, but you're going to have that. He's rock solid. His extra points, 48 to 50. Yeah, I mean, he averaged two field goals a game, and you can't ask for much better than, than what he's done. I mean, what's funny is he's never won AFC Special Teams Player of the Week, but he's won it for the month mm -hmm. twice, once this year and once last year. Kicking 44 points. 44 points in one month. Sam Martin, our punter, who made us forget about the punt god, he had, in 16 games he had 45 punts with an average of... 47.7, 16 of them inside the 20, three inside the 10 with five touchbacks. That's that's an average of three punts a game. It's really not bad. Early on in the season, we were averaging two, and we had our hiccups and, and our, our losses where we had five or six punts a game, which brought the average down uh, or up. So three, not bad. I'll take it. I just hope that we were able to retain who we want. We're able to sign some free agents that can plug in any of our weaknesses, even though we're the most rounded out team in the league. That's why we were the Super Bowl favorites in the preseason Resign maybe free agent or pending free agent Tim Settle, who says he wants to do whatever he can do to stay in Buffalo, which <laughs> kind of lowers his values for ne negotiation. But it's good to see stuff like that when you've got guys that come back. Think of all the guys the Bills brought back with Lawson, Jordan Phillips, who I didn't even mention in the stats, uh, Dean Marlowe, who they needed, thankfully, after yeah. after Hyde got hurt and Hamlin got hurt. And now a Hyde or, uh, activated him from IR, which means his surgery from a herniated disc in his neck 
has gone well. We've mentioned this before, but it, I, I'd like to repeat it for uh, for the record. Buffalo is the first team in NFL history to beat four former Super Bowl winning coaches on the road in a single regular season. That's Sean McVay in L.A., that's John Harbaugh in Baltimore, that's Andy Reid in KC, and that's Bill Belichick in New England. So that's a hell of a record and one that uh, I'm very proud of for the team. Mm -hmm. And last but not least for the Buffalo Bills is um, the home and away opponents for the 2023 season have been announced. Now, obviously, the schedule is not out, but we know who the 14 opponents are. We're going to see the AFC East uh, at home and away. And then the other opponents are? We're going to see the AFC West, uh, Broncos, Raiders, Chargers, Chiefs, of course, uh, the winners of the division. Um, we're going to see the Dallas Cowboys, New York Giants, Jacksonville Jaguars, Tampa Bay Buccaneers. So it's going to be a pretty tough schedule again. It's going to be way tougher, I think, than this year. Uh, last year's was pretty tough. If you remember, we were six and seven before we went on, or seven and six before we went on a run. And this year, 13-3, and three, you're going to get a lot of those guys that are top tier. Yeah, and then our away opponents, again, NFC East, uh, Philadelphia Eagles, and then you got the AFC North, Cincinnati Bengals, another NFC East, Washington Commanders, obviously I said KC, Chargers. So we're playing Kansas City in Kansas City for what, the fourth year in a row? Fourth year in a row. <laughs> right? Think about that. It's getting ridiculous. It's getting goddamn ridiculous. Because no matter what, in the, in the playoffs, we've played them. This will be, this year would be three years in a row, and then next year would be four years if we make yeah. it in the playoffs and likely see them again. Yep. So, Super Bowl talk, uh, talking about the favorites. Kansas City is right now the current favorite to win it all at plus 350. It was the Bills all regular season, and then obviously when we didn't have the opportunity to get the number one seed, and you've got the MVP favorite in Mahomes with 41 passing touchdowns. The best tight end in the league. It slipped, uh, yeah. and now, now plus 350 for uh, KC versus the Bills. Yep, Buffalo's in second at plus 400. Then you got Philadelphia at plus 500, San Francisco at plus 550, Cincinnati at plus 750. So when you're um, looking at that, they, they all made the playoffs, so those numbers have basically been there all season, most of the season. Yep. You've got the Bills and Chiefs number one and two. Then you've got the NFC. You've got Philly and, and Niners. So what betters are saying is that the AFC will likely win it all. And if the NFC does, it's going to be the Eagles or Niners, which I would probably agree with. And then Cincinnati, who yeah. made it there last year, is the uh, fifth best And Yeah, chance. I think as far as the MVP award goes, uh, Patrick Mahomes, I think, pulled away at the end. Um, I don't think you're going to have Burrow or Allen be in it. And I, I don't want to say that, th that it's just because they ha didn't have that additional game. That does play into it a little bit. But I think even even with the additional game, Patrick Mahomes just kind of just was too too much in that last month of the yeah. season. Um, but in the end, it will probably be they'll you know in the race of of the pool to vote on at the end, it'll be Mahomes one, um, Hertz two, Burrow three, and maybe Allen four. And Hertz and then Hertz you've got might like have won Geno it. Geno Smith being like that dark horse. Sure. If, yeah, he won't Hertz, get it. But. Yeah, Hurts, you know, and again, Hurts lost out on a few games because of injury or else maybe, yeah. Correct. But I do think Mahomes will end up getting it. Yeah. And, of course, it's always quarterbacks. You know, occasionally you get a runner up who might be a running back, which is rare. But what about Nick Bosa and his ability to be MVP for the Niners, who are one of the Super Bowl favorites? Well, I feel like... I mean, it, what about Justin Jefferson putting up... He, Led the league Randy in, Moss. Led, led the league. Yep. Moss's record, some of his records with the Vikings. 1,809 yards and eight so. touchdowns. He averaged 106 yards a game. Yeah, it's just, it's always going to be a quarterback uh, award. It's not necessarily fair, but that's just the way it's always been, and that, I don't see that changing. So We just mentioned the leading receiver with Justin Jefferson and the leading rusher who was denied a fifth-year option for the Raiders, led the league in rushing this year, Josh Jacobs, who is my fantasy football stud. He got the rushing title with 1,653 yards. It's 97 yards a game. Mm -hmm. I'll take it. Very good. And then you have uh, Jamal Williams, who ends up being the leading rushing touchdown scorer. Who would have saw that coming? I mean, I, I was I was super uh, into trying to draft DeAndre Swift for fantasy. Oh, and no. who would have thought that it ends up being Jamal Williams that be, is the fantasy stud? 
ends up, as we alluded to in the prior, prior episode, ended up beating Barry Sanders' season, uh, single season record. franchise record for rushing touchdowns. Got 17 rushing touchdowns, which is unbelievable. Behind him in second was a tie between Henry, Eckler, and Hertz with 13. Then you had in third, Elliott, Chubb, Jacobs at 12. And fourth, you had Sanders with 11. Think about that right there with Hertz. He was second in the league in rushing touchdowns with 13 as a quarterback. Yeah. That's why he was in the MVP race. And if it hadn't been for those injuries, I honestly think he'd probably get it over Mahomes. I mean, his team started, yeah. what, 12-0 and, and then went Remember, the yeah, MVP is also a narrative award. And the narrative going for Mahomes is that he lost the most talented, fa- fastest wide receiver in the league in, in Tyreek Hill and found a way through picking up free agents kind of just on a whim in yeah, Juju. In had a good Juju in um, picking up uh, Valdez Scantling, and then adding midseason um, from the Giants. Yeah. Kadarius Tony. Yes. And so because he was able to do all that and then also continue to maintain a, a Hall of Fame pace with Travis Kelsey and feeding him. They're going to break um, Brady and, and Gronkowski's yeah. record if so they haven't I think, already. I think he's deserving of it, even though it, I, I hate to say it. but You spoke of Travis Kelsey, um, but Tyree Kill, who ended up going to uh, the Dolphins, was second with 1,710 receiving mm-hmm. yards. But like I said, seven touchdowns only. Yeah. So, go to- so And then in third place, rounding out the top three for receiving was Devontae Adams after leaving uh, Aaron Rodgers and the Packers to join his college teammate and Derek Carr. We all know how that ended. Not great as he, far as Carr leaving town. He led the league in, in receiving but touchdowns. Still, still led, yeah, led the league in receiving touchdowns with 14, ended up finishing with 1,516 yards. So it, it was great on paper, not what he would have wanted to do as far as not even getting close to making the playoffs. And then so. right before the season ended, Carr gets benched. That was his college teammate, which is why he left the Packers to go there. He probably would have never left. And if Carr's officially done with them, you have to assume that Adams is out. And speaking of somebody that wants to, that's going to be out, DeAndre Hopkins for the uh, Cardinals, the GM said that they're going to, uh, mm-hmm. or sorry, the owner, because they, f- they got rid of their GM who stepped down, um, they're going to shop Hopkins. So wouldn't that be cool to see Diggs and Hopkins together, maybe? It would not happen. Uh, it would not. It's going to be a team wise. with much more cap space. Yeah, uh, yeah. People have been throwing around the Giants with how much cap they're going to have. Yeah, that with, could happen. Uh, deciding and not to, you know, well, they're still Joe gonna, Shane. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Giants got thrown around, and that seems like a pretty logical. And I'm trying to think of like a couple more teams off the top of my head that would be a good fit. That ha- they have a shit ton of money. Texans. But yeah, they, they could. Brandon Cooks is out. He goes. I am not part of a rebuild. Yeah, and he and is so DeAndre done with Hopkins them. wouldn't want to go to the Texans. No, he was already there. <laughs> He's not going to go back. Um, Browns. The Browns don't have much cap space because they've got it all tied in with God. Uh, I mean, you could see him going back with Wat- Watson. That's possible. No, you're right there. That would be a connection there. Yeah, uh, there is totally teammate. a connection but there. But cap space-wise, what's one more team that would have a ton of cap space besides the Giants? I haven't looked recently. I don't know. Uh, it's um, certainly not going to be the Chargers unless they lost Mike Williams or Keenan Allen. Uh, he would be more of a replacement than somebody. Saints, Falcons, but they're all teams that aren't contenders. They've with the got Olave right and some young guys know. that are de- yeah, yeah, who knows? But, all right, Anyways, we'll get in the kicker. Early, the early favorite position. there would be the Giants to try to get him in free agency because they have a ton of money. Yeah. To spend. Um, so kickers, I'll take this one over. Kickers always take a special place in my heart because I always wish I could have been a field goal kicker. Justin Tucker, once again, an amazing, probably future Hall of Famer, a field goal kicker, led the league with 37 field goals made. Behind him, Jason Myers for Seattle. Carlson for Las Vegas was behind him with 34 made. And then Eddie Pinheiro was number three uh, with 33, uh, 33 made. And then uh, all the way number nine, Tyler Bass with 27 made. And that's more because he had more extra points than touchdowns. You'll, you'll notice that a lot with like Harrison Butker, right? He had the longest field goal at 62 yards on the season. But when you're talking actual field goals, it's hard because in fantasy football, I drafted Evan McPherson, right? Thinking, oh, he's going to get a lot of points. He didn't do so hot. The... Um, Graham Gano got me some points for for the Giants. I ended up grabbing him when I dropped McPherson uh, on their bye week. When you're an offense that's high powered and scoring a lot, and you're actually good in the red zone, you're getting one point, one point, mm-hmm. one point. Where those teams that struggle in the red zone are getting three, three, three. Those are the ones you want. Like Young Wei Koo, yeah. he's going to get you those points yeah. every week because their offense was so inept in the red zone. I still stand by streaming. I think streaming kicks or kickers is the way to go. 
Sure, my brother drafted Justin Tucker early on, and then he realized what I had the league settings at, where um, every 10 yards is, is one point. So rather than a field goal of 37 yards being three points or 50 yards being three points, it was 50 yards would be five points. 37 yards would be 3.7. It's pretty straightforward, but that kind of takes away from what Tucker's value is because he's a guy that will consistently get the most field goal kicks because he had 37 made and that led the league. And that's because they're willing to kick it from midfield, mm-hmm. you know? Anyway, that's that's the kicker. He's kind of like Travis Kelsey of the kickers, like the outlier of, of not, it, not having, like of, if you're going to take a chance at drafting oh, that yeah. position. Yeah, that's true. And they're on the same team. Uh, let's get into punters. Ryan Stonehouse for Tennessee. <laughs> He's a household name. Lead punters. Get it? Household name, Stonehouse. Uh, Lead punters with an average of 53.1 per punt. You had Townsend for Kansas City in number two at 50.4. So get that straight. Their offense is great, and if they happen to have to punt, they're going to flip the field. Mm -hmm. I mean, they have such a well-rounded team. Yeah. And then you got Cook uh, with Jacksonville, 49.3, and number four, Cole. Uh, So, Naeem Hines uh, with the electric season finale in Buffalo – Led the league with two uh, kickoff returns, and all in the yeah. same game. <laughs> he he was the only one in the in the entire NFL who had two kickoff returns for a touchdown, and they were in the same damn game. Unbelievable. And then in number two, it was a four way tie between Patterson, Nixon, Duvernay, and Nwangu. Uh, all had one return for a touchdown. Yeah, and then I don't even want to. Uh, Aluakon, Foisade. Foisade. We'll just say Aluakon. Aluakon. He's a linebacker. Aluakon. He had the most tackles in the league with 184. I remember when 100 was a lot. Nick Bolton, another good player for Kansas City, a good draft pick. I actually think he's a really nice player. He had 180. He was in second. And then Baltimore, who just signed Roquan Smith to a five-year, $100 million deal, he finished with 169 for third. Not bad. And then uh, Zaire uh, Franklin, 166 at fourth. Now we get into the NFC East. So this is a wild stat. NFC East, which ended up being the NFC Beast this year. Really, it was the NFC Beast and the AFC Beast that were uh, really two strong divisions for much of the year. Uh, NFC East still has not had a repeat champion since the Eagles won four straight titles from 2001 to 2004. So since then, it's every year it's been a different team in the AFC East. I mean, that is a, a division that beats the hell out of each other. It's just like AFC West, right? They expected that... That, that would happen this year, and it didn't. KC obviously was above the rest. Yeah, and, and you got the Bills getting three in a row. That's true. Starting that's to take true. control of that. We'll see. We'll see where that, that goes. I mean, good. think about when Brady was with the Patriots. I mean, they won it nearly every year. Yeah, yeah. The last time somebody else had won it, I think, was the 08 Miami team, and then I think the Jets had won. Other than that, for 20 years, it was mm-hmm. the Patriots. Talking about uh, some not-so-good things, uh, a player that's on his head coach's sh- list, yeah. Quay Walker. Shoved a Lions staff member in the last game of the season um, in that pivotal game trying to secure that playoff spot. Ended up getting ejected. Ended up making a boneheaded play when he played Buffalo where he punched pretty much a practice squad player that was in street clothes. Yeah, a tight end who who a lot of people at the the time thought was... a A lot of people thought that that was a staff member. But like you said, he was a practice squad tight end and this hothead was the only player in the league to be ejected twice in one season. So congratulations, dumbass. <laughs> yeah, I won't even clap. <laughs> yeah, right? Quay Walker, man. You you got to figure out uh, anger management. So get some help, and uh, maybe you'll do a little better next year for your team instead of dragging them down and maybe, potentially uh, costing them the game. reach out to Aaron Rodgers and see if you can't go on a, maybe an ayahuasca trip or something. <laughs> maybe that's it. Relax. So you have Colt Safety and DeMar Hamlin's high school teammate Rodney Thomas II honor DeMar after his inter- interception during the game in Week 18, which was pretty special. It was great to see a lot of people honoring Hamlin throughout the the league and a lot of pregame stuff. You saw the one game where Russell Wilson goes out there, and I forget who the other guy was. Both number three. Both number three. He's a, he's a good player, too, and I can't think of his name right off the top of my head. I was watching Red Zone. And it was the last one of the regular season, which is the last one of the season. They don't do the playoffs since there's only so many games. You know, there's going to be two Saturday games, three Sunday games, and one Monday night game. So, Red Zone, its purpose has been served. Uh, 1,019 regular season touchdowns. That includes 578 passing touchdowns, 379 rushing touchdowns, 59 defense and special teams touchdowns, and three other. And among those three other are like, Offensive linemen, 
picking up a fumble in the end zone for a touchdown or seeing with, with the defensive line. Zero breathing room. He tries to sneak it. The ball is loose. Impossible. Do the Vikings have it? Scrambling for the ball. It is a touchdown on their last breath. When it comes to being an NFL fan, and in specific, a uh, fantasy football fan during the season, there's not much better than after you watch your favorite team play, just kind of settling down with a blanket and just kind of getting laying on the couch, maybe in and out of a nap, having a cold beer, watching all the touchdowns get scored, keeping track of your fantasy team. It's the little things in life. I mean, those were some of the highlights. I, we've got other stuff for uh, for like coaches being fired and stuff like that. But I want to get in right now um, the playoff bracket. So the first game of the playoffs. Playoffs? Don't talk about it. playoffs. You kidding me? Playoffs? I just hope we can win a game. Every week without fail, we've got something we can throw in there. But the number seven seed in the AFC Miami Dolphins will go to Buffalo on Sunday, January 15th, to play in Buffalo at 1 p.m. Eastern on CBS. And then the, the next game after that will be the number six Baltimore Ravens taking on the number three Cincinnati Bengals in Cincinnati. Second week in a row they play each other. It's uh, Sunday. Primetime. January 15th in primetime, 8.15 on NBC. We've got number five Chargers at number four Jacksonville. On Saturday. That's yeah. on Saturday, 8.15 p.m. on primetime or on NBC primetime. And uh, Kansas City's on by. Yep. Let's go through uh, those. So I'm guessing we're going to pick the Bills, right? We're picking the Bills? Yeah. And then I'm going to pick Cincinnati because with or without Lamar, I think he's going to be a little rusty after being out for six consecutive weeks if he doesn't play. Well, five consecutive weeks. Yeah, Cincinnati wins. And then we've got the Chargers and the Jacksonville <sighs> Jaguars. Tough. You've got Herbert going against Lawrence in Jacksonville with Herbert, um, I'm sorry, with Jacksonville on a five-game win streak. No Mike Williams for the Chargers. They do have still have a great running game with Eckler, and they still have... Herbert, who's a great, talented, natural passer. But you also have the Jaguars, who they didn't necessarily pass my eye, eye test last week against the Titans. Only I, I expected them to beat up a Titans team that was without a legit quarterback. Yeah. And they weren't able to necessarily put them away for much of that game. But if you watch a few of the plays, um, you had this uh, play that, that Lawrence messed up on where it was supposed to be this toss like a trick play yeah. and he tossed it too high for his wide receiver because he's so tall yeah. and the receiver was like you know I five foot it. nothing yep and so it goes over his head so that would have been a potential touchdown when they, you, you saw how much opening there was if it mm -hmm. would have been a reverse and then he missed a wide open guy in the end zone where he just overthrew it way over his head so that was 14 points they left on the board so I'm gonna I'm gonna go with the Jaguars here even though I think it's gonna be a crazy close game uh, but I'm going to go with Jaguars getting that momentum from the whole home, home field crowd. And uh, I think that Lawrence ends up playing a cleaner game this time and does just enough to get a win. Do you realize that Jacksonville beat them 38 to 10 last time they played? I did not remember. I don't remember that. I'm pretty sure. I'm going to I'm going to look that up. Yeah. Look at that. They beat them 38 to 10. And in, in, in week three, the Chargers got trounced by uh, the Jaguars 38 to 10. So if it goes anything like that, <laughs> watch out. But I still say the Chargers are dangerous. Well, maybe Mike Williams just got banged up because Staley had started his starters and they still got beaten uh, at home, right? Against the Broncos. Yeah. Uh, they got By beat. a field goal. Yep. Uh, all right, go Jacksonville. But uh, that should be the closest game of, of the weekend for the AFC. Yeah, you, yeah. It, that's probably going to be the marquee one as and far the, as competitiveness goes the afc title right now in the betting lines are plus 170 for kc slightly better than buffalo at plus 200 and then cincinnati's plus 450 chargers plus 1000 ravens plus 1800 jaguars plus 2000 and dolphins plus 3000 i'd so, put the jaguars over the Ra ravens right now to get there i'd rather see baltimore than than the Bengals, but it would be kind of bittersweet it's because they never got to play that game and with the yeah, no, I want out. it. I want the I want that Bengals game. Yeah, uh, we need to we need to play it. Yeah, it didn't get played the first time for obvious reasons. There's been a lot of talk now since then amongst the fan bases about who got screwed over what with the with the rules that got remade, I guess, by the league. Yeah, uh, for an unprecedented situation. I'm I want to see that team. Let's see what happens. 
it would be a hell of a of a story for that game to be canceled in week 17 and then they play each other week 20. That would be pretty sweet. And it would be playoffs, so all the Bengals fans that are bitching, they'll have the opportunity right there. I know it'll be in Buffalo and, you know, hypothetically, That's all right. if the they, Bengals they said won, that it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't yeah. matter what the NFL does to yeah. coddle other teams. It doesn't matter where they play. They're going to beat anyone to get to the Super Bowl. So it's we'll like, see if that's what happens. It's like Reed, uh, when they asked Andy Reed how he felt about, you know, it being uh, a neutral site, the AFC championship, if it's against the Bills, he goes, we'll go play out in the parking yeah, lot. Well, how did, how did you feel about getting the number one seed when the Bills and the Bengals didn't get a, another additional game to try to... But he so. said, I... I am okay playing out in the parking lot, which means I don't care. Yeah. We'll play them anywhere. And yeah. I like that answer. That's that's the way to, to answer it. It's a good and attitude. And then looking at the teams that had a winning record this year, because with 17 games, <laughs> most of the teams played 17 games. Um, the ones that didn't had above that anyway. Seven of the 16 teams um, on each in each conference were above 500. So that's I thought that was pretty cool. It stood out. Um, and then NFC. We'll get into the matchups there. The number seven seed Seahawks go to San Francisco. I went to that matchup when it was in Seattle a couple weeks ago, and now they play again. The Seahawks with Geno Smith have been kind of in in a decline, where the Niners have won five in a row with Brock, their Brock Purdy, their uh, rookie, Mister Irrelevant. They play on Saturday at 4:30 p.m. Eastern on Fox, and that's going to be hopefully a closer matchup than it was the last mm. game. But I still say San Francisco is yeah. probably going to roll. I think San Francisco wins, and then we've got. The number six New York Giants go to Minnesota, number three Minnesota, and that's going to be on Sunday at 4.30 Eastern. I would love to see Brian Dable and the Giants win because I think the Vikings have, what, won 11 or 12 of their, all of their close games by one score. And like I said earlier in the year, that number doesn't mean anything once you get to the playoffs. If you can't win the close ones, then uh, peace out. And... Most likely the Giants lose here. But I, I hate to do this, and if I'm wrong, that's fine because it means my family, who are mostly Vikings fans, will be happy. But I'm going with the upset of the weekend. I'm going Giants beat the Vikings at home. I think that the okay. Vikings' cardiac ways finally catch up to them, and they, they have been the cardiac cats, if you will. Wouldn't surprise me so. one bit. I mean, they've got the number one receiver in the league, uh, stats-wise. They've got one of the best running backs in Delvin Cook. They've got... A top 10 quarterback who may be boring but puts up numbers. And they've got Martindale as a defensive coordinator who came over from the Ravens and he don't sleep on him because he knows what he's doing. And if there's a guy that can try to scheme up something to try to kid an upset on the defensive yep. side. That's going to be a good matchup. So that's the matchup to watch like we're watching Jacksonville and Chargers, right? Because Dallas plays Tampa and even In though Monday night. Tampa Bay, <laughs> Tampa Bay, uh, Tom is 7-0 and against Dallas, which is a crazy stat means nothing when most and of that was in the AFC. Dallas doesn't really have any momentum going into this game after no. getting the shit on by the Commanders. I mean, these these are two teams that are just not really know. playing great right now. No, they're not. No, uh, Prescott with all the interceptions and then Tampa. Tom Brady finished second in the league in passing, and he had a good season statistically, but he could not get on the same page with Mike Evans and these other guys that he's got on his team that – should have led them to a much better than 8-9 record, but they still got yeah, the division. They've got, yeah, they've dealt with a lot of injuries themselves, offensive line issues. Who are we picking? Injuries. I'm going to go with the Cowboys, but to me it's a coin flip. Yeah. So you're picking Dallas. Uh, I'll go with that as well. I it's mean, a coin flip. I mean, you never want to bet against Brady, as they say, and he's undefeated against them, but I feel like Dallas has more talent. Last year, they ran out of time. Their in that defense last play, you doesn't travel as well, though. If it was in Dallas, I would feel a little bit more confident. Yeah. But I say it's a coin flip because both teams just don't seem to want to win games. I, yeah. I, I don't know. It's going to be a weird game. It, it is. I, I mean, wouldn't be surprised if either win it. I, I don't know. But, like, yeah, what what's going on with Prescott? He's turning the ball over. Brady, they lose to the... Falcons last weekend. Yep. They had the guaranteed four seed. They won their division. They had already yeah, beaten but You Carolina. know that they didn't want to roll in with an eight and nine record. No, Brady, Brady, that was the first time he had ever had a losing record to finish a yeah. regular season. Just weird matchup. As far as the passing leaders, you have Patrick Mahomes, who set the record for most offensive yards in the season at 5,614 yards. Good for him. He I mean, passed through Brees. It's unbelievable. He, what he's doing uh, year in and year out, just like what a lot of these quarterbacks are doing, we can't take it for granted because once they're gone we're going to wish that they were still here i mean this is another the, you know this is another golden era of quarterback play that that's right in front of our very eyes and his 5250 
passing yards was fourth most in NFL history behind Manning from 2013, Breeze in 2011, and Brady in 2021. He, uh, out of those yards, 358 were rushing and six were receiving. He completed a pass to himself. It yeah. must have been deflected and he, yep. he picked it. I think I, I watched it. Anyway, if you watch Andy Reid and his play calling, he's so creative and imaginative. And he also does things to kind of make the defense look foolish. Um, KC did this ring around the rosy huddle break. And it ended up being a touchdown that got called back. But it just shows you how much fun Reed is having so many years into the league. He, he was good for Philadelphia. He's been great for Kansas City. I like him. I just think it sucks that we have to play him uh, so often. And yes, he does, does make Dorsey look bad because his play calling is so much more creative. But again, first year... Um, it, that could be more scrambling drill issues for the for the Bills where Dorsey makes the right call, but after the first four or five seconds where Allen's running for his life, uh, the improv skills of some of these younger receivers aren't aren't working out. Like I said earlier, Dorsey has been requested for a head coach. Uh, they're also going to, uh, in Carolina, look at Steve Wilkes, who is the interim head coach, and then Jim Caldwell and Frank Reich. So who knows where that'll go, but I said that Joe Brady could uh, fill in for Dorsey if needed. Um we don't know where that'll go. Andy Reid clinches his number one seed for the sixth time in his career. And the bad news is he's never won a Super Bowl as a number one seed. So let's let's uh, prevent him from even going. How many of those were with the Eagles? Two? One? Well, let's Some see. With Mahomes, they've been to the AFC Championship. Oh, you mean the Super Bowls? To even go? Because well, they how, lost how against times, Brady. How many times was he a number one seed when he was with, um, I'm trying to think of it. Why they won, they Donovan won McNabb. one. Donovan McNabb. I'm trying to, McNabb. I know, but they won one with Mahomes, and they lost one with Mahomes. Mm-hmm. And he's been to the AFC Championship like four years, uh, where the, he didn't even have to ever play outside of Kansas City, yeah. which is unreal. Anyway, I don't know that number uh, yeah, was, offhand, but we mentioned Mike Tomlin still not having a losing record after 16 seasons. Yep. The Steelers were 3-7 and seven the morning of Thanksgiving, and they went on a run to go 6-1 and one down the stretch and not allowing 20 or more points. In those games. What a solid mm-hmm. season for the defense uh, in the second half. And then there was a Steelers player who did the little CPR celebration on one of his guys. I, I honestly think he it was just like poor judgment because Madden had it a full celebration. A, a popular video game is making some changes. And it comes after what happened at Buffalo Bills player DeMar Hamlin on the field last week. The makers of Madden NFL 23 are removing a touchdown celebration that shows players pretending to do CPR in the end zone after scoring. The celebration existed in the game already, but EA Sports says it plans to release a software update and it plans to do so soon. It does Madden had a to pull the celebration where they're doing the CPR from the game. If it's a, if it's a signal Signature celebration in Madden, that yeah. means that clearly That's well, my point. <laughs> it must happen in the league a decent amount. Yeah, for sure. So it was probably poor judgment because knowing Tomlin, he wouldn't allow something like that. Being that he coaches in Pittsburgh, he's got a friendship with McDermott that goes back to his playing days in college. Now, if we talk real quick about who um, may step away, the GM for the Arizona Cardinals has already stepped down. But Sean McVay, who won the Super Bowl last year, now had a five-win season this year. You think he'll call it quits? Uh, yes. I think for not not permanently, but he's going to take a, a few years to enjoy his mansion and his smoke show of a wife. And do you think that has anything to do with to his lay by the bay? His um have a opportunity on TV. Uh, I mean, yeah, he could do a couple of years TV and then you know wait out till he sees a really like cool. Yeah, coaching position again. Yeah, I mean he's still young. Obviously, but, he's got the rest of his life. I mean, life if he's if he's out. letting his like assistant coaches start looking for other jobs, I don't know. Well, true. Uh, JJ Watt is calling it a career. He's I think he's clearly a Hall of Famer, and he's retiring with twelve and a half sacks in his final season. So he's got a young family, a beautiful wife. He wants to spend time with them. He's had some injuries. He's battled back from. Obviously, he's passed the torch to his brother, who's doing well for the Steelers when he's mm-hmm. healthy. He's had some health issues as well, but. You know, what a career. I, I think he's doing great. If that's the choice he makes, fans can't be upset with that. It's just like Andrew Luck, right? It sucks when you get someone who is, you know, labeled as, like, the generational talent. And then after just a handful of years, the franchise put everything into him. And he's like, I, I don't want to play. And whether it's health-related, mental health, or physical, um, if they make that choice, that's theirs. It's a risk think, they were willing to take early on. I think if on. he sensed that they were right there for winning a Super Bowl, he would have maybe given it one more year, but he knows yeah. that they're not. So, 
And speaking of writing on the wall. And speaking of the Colts, their general manager Chris Ballard actually spoke recently and said that trade for Carson Wentz, where they give where they gave the Eagles a first rounder, it really affected him, and it, and it still hasn't left his mind. You know, we thought with Carson we were getting a young enough player that we could have a guy that could be here for the long term for at least a five, six, seven year run. We, you know, and we weren't right on that decision. Um, and then giving up the assets at the time um, probably cost us from being able to get one in 21 and then not having a first round pick this last year restricted that. And now they're still scrambling for another quarterback because clearly Sam Elling- Ellinger uh, wasn't the answer early on. Now maybe he'll develop in the off season and be something, but as far as year one, year two, uh, wasn't the answer. Like we said, Pete Carroll still doing good things. Cliff Kingsbury was fired in, in uh, Arizona Sean Payton is being interviewed in Denver. That would give that would be draft picks mm-hmm. because he's still technically under contract uh, with the Saints. Titans fired their offensive coordinator, Todd Downing. Uh, they've also – there was other coaches, offensive coordinators that were fired uh, this week. Brady, even though he's had that losing season, he's still – 490 completions, most in a single season in NFL history. 490 completions on 733 pass attempts. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah. And we've mentioned Brock Purdy being 5-0 and so far. Uh, first quarterback since 1950 to start 5-0, and and the last one to start 4-0 and was Kurt Warner. Wow. And the Cowboys led the league in takeaways back-to-back seasons under Dan Quinn, who likely will get a head coach interview somewhere, if not more than one. Um, first time since Pittsburgh Steel Curtain team in 72 through 74. That's very impressive. First of four that decade for the Steelers. Mm-hmm. Dak Prescott... Sets the record in the wrong way. We mentioned that him and Mills led the league with 15 interceptions, and that's despite Dag missing five games with uh, injuries. So Eagles pass rush, we mentioned fourth uh, team in the Super Bowl era with 70-plus sacks in a season. Impressive. They joined 84 and 87 Bears and 89 Vikings. That's incredible. Yeah. And they're the first team to have four players with 10-plus sacks. That's Reddick, uh, Sweat, Hargrave, and Graham. Uh, Titans punter, we mentioned Stonehouse. Oh, he is a household name. Ryan Stonehouse breaks <laughs> Sammy Bo, Bow's record. I think it's Ba. B- Sammy Ba's record with 53.1 yards per punt. Yeah, so he set Santa a record for average punt. Wow. 53.1. That's crazy. And uh, Jamal, we already mentioned mm-hmm. that he set the record. A.J. Brown set the Eagles single season record for receiving at 1,496 yards. That breaks Mike Quick's record in 1983. Um, Bill Belichick. Uh, he confirmed that he's going to return as the coach. Shocker. But there's talk that Kraft is going to hold the team accountable in the offseason and do some research and figure out what he's going to do. And I think there's a chance that he makes Belichick step down from GM because he's got so many things going on. He's going to do uh, – Robert Kraft said he's going to do some critical evaluations. Um, we'll see. I mean, that would obviously be crazy with him taking the team to what six super bowl or winning six out of nine super bowls that was all with brady yeah yep uh they ranked it dang near at the bottom of the league in every major category in offense under matt patricia so that experiment failed yes uh, it did. i don't think he'll be back and then their special teams unit finished dead last in uh dvoa so cam Aker, whatever however you pronounce it he's out um most likely and uh could Kraft replace belichick do you think uh, like get a different person to cover for GM? Yeah, like retain yeah. him as head coach? Yeah. Yeah. I can see that happening. Okay. I yeah. think Belichick's going to throw a fit about it. but. And do you think that Tom Brady ends up retiring, returning to the Bucks, returning to the Patriots to end his career, <laughs> sign with the Raiders, or elsewhere? Uh, I think he's going to either end up a Dolphin or a Raider. Okay. Yeah. I mean, there was uh, rumblings in the offseason of him, you know, with that whole Miami thing. The Colts, their former quarterback, Jim Harbaugh, he said he's going to go back to Michigan, but there's been talk about him maybe being considered as a head coaching interview for the Colts. What yeah, do you think? I think he's got an itch to go back to the NFL. And then the Packers were eliminated from the playoffs after their loss, um, who helped Seattle back into the mm-hmm. playoffs at the seventh seed. Man, uh, Seattle was having one, one fun night there on Sunday night. Yeah. Watching that game. Although I think Carroll and Belichick should both retire I really like Pete Carroll. He's I someone do too. I, can I think he's for. a good coach. Now, do you think that Aaron Rodgers having lost again after back-to-back MVP seasons and not taking them to a Super Bowl, and then this year losing to the Lions in the last week to to it was winning in and they didn't get it. 
Now Rodgers is like, I need to take the offseason to think about it. Do you think he retires? Don't really care right now, to be honest. <laughs> Either sure get off the pot. Yeah. He, the key thing he said in his uh, post-game press conference is he's not going to hold the Packers hostage. No one wants to see that anymore. Yeah. So just make up your mind. That yeah. seemed to be a very good self-reflecting comment he made there. So then follow that. Take a month off, but make a make a decision, and then just be, well, they need to be done or just keep going. They've if you're got gonna, Jordan Love. If you're gonna, yeah, if you're gonna keep on playing, then be dedicated to your young guys on the team yeah. and show up, you know, for some off season uh, workouts and and try to implement things so that you're not complaining all year and looking at the camera like you know pissed off. So, you know, like you say you're not going to hold them hostage. Good. Don't like just make a decision and let's move on. Now, with Carr being benched in Las Vegas, do you think they retain him for next year? Uh, trade him? Cut him? Carr could end up in the AFC East. Yeah. I, I could see him going to the Jets. He certainly could. And I think Robert Sala is a good coach. And I think they're missing, obviously, that as a key because their defense is fantastic and they've got a lot of young talent and if <laughs> their running back obviously comes back healthy that's going to be a hell of a team to look out for because Brees Hall is is no joke yeah I guess well I was going to say Giants could try to go for Derek Carr but now they're going to give Daniel Jones another shot yeah because they did pretty well with him and Saquon I think a lot of that had to do with Brian Dayball actually Falcons utilizing. need a quarterback they could maybe go after Derek Carr uh Saints could go after Derek Carr yeah, that's true. They could Just keep him in the. You know, they wouldn't probably. I guess you know. Then th that would be okay with the Raiders too, because then he wouldn't be in the AFC. Kirk Herbstreet did Amazon Prime Games on Thursday this year, and he did 16 shows. He did 18 college football games for ESPN. He did 15 games for Amazon Prime, and he did all that in 36 cities this year. I've been everywhere, man. He's he's impressive in college as far as the commentator goes. And in the NFL, I think Thursday night, Prime had some some shaky moments. They had some really cool pregame and postgame interviews and stuff because I, I really like that crew. Ryan Fitzpatrick was yeah. a good addition. Yeah, and Sherman, you know, who's obviously got a mouth. Um, he's good. Uh, but I think that Kirk Herbstreet was uh, polarizing. A lot of people either loved or hate him. You remember back in the day on Monday Night Football with Madden, he was just straight up and said very basic things like, oh, oh yeah, he's got our, yeah, when he passes the ball for 10 yards, he's going to get a first down. <laughs> like, well, duh. Uh, Herb Street kind of does that where he, but he, he like, he talks to the audience like they're dumb because he's expecting that they don't know football. And that's how somebody new watching football needs to learn. But Yeah, he's got a great voice for it. Yeah. Like, he's got kind of a calming, like, even-keeled voice for doing, like, analysis, but yeah. How do you think Prime did overall this year? I think they got shafted on the matchup, so, like, it was just dumb luck. There weren't many touchdowns. It was all field goals early on in the year, and then they finished a little stronger, mm, yeah. but... I give, them, I give it, like, a 6 out of 10, mainly because it got carried by the post-game crew. Well, that's it. I just wanted to see what you guys thought of Kirk Herbstreet. Um, what, what do you think of the season in general? We did our Buffalo recap, and then we talked about the rest of the league, the matchups going into the wild card round. And uh, the yeah, only thing fans from all teams, like, you know, if your team's in the playoffs and we talked about it, like, you know, leave a comment. Let us know what you think is going to happen. Let us know if you think the Bills uh, are going to ride the emotion of what happened uh, against the Bengals. Was that going to carry them to a potential Lombardi? Or do you think that emotionally they're going to become exhausted having to deal with everything they've gone through in the season? So let us know what you think about anything and everything. Yeah. And I mean, obviously, this is our 31st episode. And we've been doing this all season, every week. Um, I want to know uh, what you guys think. I think from the first episode until now, we've come a long way. And um, we're going to do it again. You know, there was a, a hater in the comments that said, oh, I give you guys two to three years, and then, you know, they're going to ultimately get rid of Josh Allen and you'll fizzle out. <laughs> I, I want to say I've gotten the I've gotten very lucky to be able to come to Scott's studio here every week and uh be able to have a beer to talk about football um so it's been a pleasure for me uh shout out to the man sitting next to me here this guy puts in hours upon hours every week editing and and going through and censoring my my f-bombs uh, my cussing yeah uh, uh but yeah this this guy spends so much time behind the scenes putting in work that doesn't get seen so kudos to you my friend thank you uh, we when we envisioned this, we've talked about it for four or five years now. We we just thought we're going to flip the camera. We're going to do a two shot and it's going to be no editing. It's just going to be live. We didn't get there this year. 
Um, we're going to get there for the playoffs and going into next year. And, and in the offseason, it would be nice when we get into draft talk, uh, offseason acquisitions and stuff like that. Uh, training camp, all that. It was a yeah, good it's pilot a pleasure. season. It's, it was a good yes. pilot season, yes. and we got to fine tune some things. Yes. This was my first time ever doing a podcast in front of a camera. You've got a lot more experience in regards to sp- talking in front of a camera and producing, and yeah. so it, I learned a lot from you. Uh, you probably didn't learn that much from me, but um, uh, yeah, it, it's a uh, next year should be fun. We'll do more live stuff. Speaking of live. We are going to, um, if everything goes according to plan, on upcoming this Sunday for the wild card game uh, at 10 a.m. West Coast time, we are going to, before that kickoff, try to do a live broadcast from the cheerful bullpen, which is the Bills backer bar in downtown Portland. That's the plan right now. Yeah, and, and I'll, I'll probably give uh, an announcement somewhere on Twitter. I mean, my I have Twitter. It's at Scott Martin. You have one. Is it Nickname Hollywood? Oh, uh, yeah. My, my Twitter is Nickname Hollywood. I don't use it much, but I also have an Instagram, same name nicknamed Hollywood. We'll both try to spam it out. You know, I um, might I might even do it live if possible through Facebook as well at the same time through Streamlabs or something. Yeah, and if you, you know, if you appreciate the hard work that we put in, the hard work that he puts in with editing and making it uh, look really crisp and professional and the graphics that are added, don't forget to to click, to like, share, subscribe. It means a lot to us. And uh, and, and also, yeah, comment. If you want to leave a comment, we'll, you know, even if you leave a comment about a different team, if you want a Josh Allen card, uh, you know, if you put in a comment, we'll uh, ask for your information. Scott can send you a, one of his personal Josh Allen cards, and yeah, you know, have us have yourself a, a cool collectible there. So, speaking of the cards, we have two here. We feature one every single episode on on both sides of the football, and I'm going to show this one here. I thought this was fitting because it is 2022 score football, and it's squad. Now, if you look closely. On the right side, you're going to see when DeMar Hamlin was number 31 last year. He's in the photo. So I thought that was really cool. Nice. It's a cool card. It's numbered 15 of 50, and it really uh, shines well. So that's my card. Cool. It's a horizontal card. Let's see yours. I got one that was from a pretty nostalgic Thanksgiving game against the Dallas Cowboys. And this is a 2020 Panini Legacy Football fan favorites. You got Josh Allen, where he had just taken a bite out of the turkey leg. He's got the towel waving above his head, yep. pumping up the Bills Mafia that were still at AT&T Stadium celebrating a Thanksgiving win. You got the, the backside, same, same image there. And it's numbered. And yeah, you got a, it's a numbered 54 of 100, so pretty cool. Yes, sir. Well, what do you have to say to uh, Bills Mafia for the season? Bills Mafia, man, it's been an awesome season. Uh, for those of you that followed us all year, thanks again for taking the time uh, with so much content out there um, to choose from. Hopefully we were able to give you some laughs and some tidbits of information throughout the season and, and make it uh, enjoyable for you to kind of have like a have something to follow as we uh, you know followed our favorite team week in and week out. So I think there was uh, there was fun to be had all year. It was a, a lot more of a roller coaster than I think anyone imagined. Um, lots of ups, lots of downs, and hopefully we can get some more ups here to end the final month of the season. Um, so yeah, there was plenty of Labatt's drink. I think there was plenty of tables that were uh, jumped through responsibly. We didn't jump and through any tables yet. We will. Yeah, we, we will. will. And uh, playoff time, table... A table will be uh, ready on ice yep. <laughs> uh, for the Dolphins game. And so, yeah, and there were uh, hopefully there were some hydration breaks taken throughout the season. I know I'm going to probably have to go on a little bit of a beer break once the season comes to a conclusion. Give my old liver a, a, a little rest. We're going on, what, five months of this? So Think yeah. about it. Because the re- uh, preseason starts in August, and the regular season ends beginning of January. And then if they make it to the Super Bowl, that's in February. Then, then we'll have the draft in April, journey. and then there's training camp in June, July. It's like, woof. Mm-hmm. But that is our recap on the year. Our, if we go back to episode one and watch that and hold ourselves accountable, we both predicted 13 and 4, 14 and 3. Yeah. And it was eight points that separates us from being undefeated. It was a yeah, hell of you a can, regular You can season. call us homers, but when your team puts out a product like they do these last two, three years, it makes us look good. certainly does. Positions. There's one thing I want to uh, do before we leave. I've had this sitting here all episode. This just came in the mail literally today. It's 
Fisher Price Little People. I ordered this back in October and it just came in. But how cool is that? I ordered it hopefully hoping I'd get it for Christmas for my uh, one year old Saber. But this right here is Sean McDermott. Stefan Diggs and Josh Allen. They got their little... Uh, McDermott's got his headset and hat, and then uh, Allen and Diggs have the beanies. Yeah, that's really cool. Now, Fisher Price is actually located in East Aurora. That's in Western New York. About 25 minutes from where I grew up and about five minutes from my my great... Uh, my grandparents had a house, and my mom owns a house now. So that's really cool. What's funny is it says this is from East Aurora, but made in China like most products. <laughs> uh, well... That's going to do it for episode 31 and our regular season recap of The House That Allen Built. As always, I'm Scott Martin, and with me... As always, Greg <laughs> Vollmer. Let's go! Buffalo. Buffalo! I f***ed that one up at the end. That's all right. We're good? Yeah. Checking, checking, check one, check one, check one, two, 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 check two, check two, check three, sibilance, sibilance. By only two. Last year he had 122 for attempts. This year he had 124. Wait, what am I looking at? Oh, I'm looking at rushing. Let's start that part again. Mm -hmm. I was gonna say that's very low. What are you doing? Sorry. You just keep looking away. Sorry. I'll just have to my stay phone, on me. Sorry, my phone's getting blown um, up. So the first game of the playoffs is gonna be playoffs? <laughs> playoffs? You kidding me? Playoffs? I'm sober enough to know what I'm doing and drunk enough to enjoy doing it. Let's get ready to rumble. Let's get ready to rumble. Rumble. Rumble in the jungle. Welcome back. And we're back. And we're back. And we're back. And we're back. Okay. Uh -huh. Uh, 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 why can't I get that? I don't know, because uh, uh, your balls haven't dropped. Ready? I love this song. Is your mom actually watching these? Yeah, she didn't want to see any more farts. Then... That's why she stopped watching, so she can yeah. ever watch again. Professional, whatever. It's Being a professional. sports podcast. You disrespectful motherfucker. Take it back. Oh my you pen. Your what? Drop my pen. You dropped it during the episode. Yeah. If you want to hit restart on there, hit the fucking red button. Hit it. It's up top.